Um, so yeah, please, Veronica, go ahead. Well, thanks, Debbie. Yeah, we're very excited about that. We've pulled together a lot of our resources and we'll be making them available to people who are just about ready to write the exam. If you haven't been through the DMVOC, it's not for you. If you if you haven't been through the DMBOC, it would be better to, to do the, the data management fundamentals training. It's for people that that have, are, are experienced, that have worked hard. Um, be, be careful if you are an experienced person, because sometimes your terminology doesn't align with the DMBOC. But this will help you in that in that sense because it's question based, it's active learning. We've got uh, 321 actual exam questions that were found floating around on the on, on the internet, and we've got another 400 and something that we've made up ourselves. So we've we've got around 750 practice questions, and you will do them. You can do them chapter wise, or you can do them all as a big batch, but. The plan is to go through these questions, especially the 321, so that you get 100%. Things that you need to look up, then you look at it where, where you get your questions wrong. Obviously, that's where you need revision, but you don't need to revise the entire DMBOC. We've included our um, summary notes that people who come on our training get. That will be um, an, an extra. We've got mind maps that if you like to do things that way. We've got videos of the refresher that I used to do on Saturdays. We've got the, the videos and the slides from the refresher. All of that is part of it. And we've had a group of beta testers that we, we, we chose to run through it to see how it's going. And we really got one who's shining, Johan. Kutzer. He's, he's he's our our champion beta tester. Um, he's, what about Paul? Paul is also doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody is touching Johan at the moment. He sees that he's attacked that bank of three hundred and twenty one, and and doing really well at it. But it's been fantastic. He's found a lot of typos and a lot of funny issues, and our instructions maybe weren't so clear, and all of that has really helped. So it's supposed to be. You sign up, there's instructions, you do a pre-assessment to see where you are, and that pre-assessment is probably very similar to the DM Fundamentals exam. So it's designed to help you cram for your exam at home, but you do need to have DMBOC, um, you, you need to have been through the DMBOC or have DMBOC aligned knowledge before you attempt that. Maybe if you could just ask Johan or Paul to comment on on how it's been going and how do you guys find this form of of learning because it's quite different to learning in a on a online session or, or, or teams or or face to face. Paul, maybe from your side. Thanks, Hard. Yeah, I just um, as mentioned, to you guys, I found it different and and actually appeals to me, meaning. If you ask me to go away and study the DMBOC or series of notes, I find it uh, tough to engage with 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 notes and all those kind of things, reading and all that. But the the activeness or the active learning approach of doing a test. So I've taken the approach of do the test, see where I'm going wrong, go and research, and then uh, and then go re redo the test over and over to 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 reinforce the learning. I find is helping me personally. I know that. Um, I mentioned Melinda's also doing it and she finds it a different approach. She does the test, yes, but then she goes and studies the, the notes and does her note taking and all that. So the two different approaches, but mine is definitely that, that activeness. Keep going, keep going. Uh, almost like a challenge. You know, when you're running a 400 meter, you've got to get to that finish line. So you struggle across. Um, and then obviously the advice is get the 100 percent, get get the 100 percent consistently, which means you've actually Remember the answer you've 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 taken notes of what's happening there, and then move on to the review questions, and then move on to the next set. So that definitely has helped me. Yeah, fantastic. Maybe a comment from Johan. Hi everybody. Yeah, so um, I want to say this is awesome. Um, please follow Veronica's guidance. Yeah, yeah. Do the questions, <laughs> then understand where you've got the gaps, then go back and do that. It works like a charm. So thank you very much. Perfect. Excellent. We look forward to some great results. Sir. 
<laughs> that did any, any final comments from Veronica? No, no, the proof's going to be in your hand getting his master pass. Oh. Fantastic. Okay, guys, um, thank you very much, Veronica. Thanks, Debbie. Um, I'm just going to take over. JG, can you come back to life? Absolutely. I am in the mix. How it? Fantastic, JG. Good to see you again. Um, so one of the things that we, we are thinking of adding to this DIY is also what we refer to as a, as a career assessment. And we have JG with us today, and he's done uh, most of the different aspects. There's just the final roadmap that he needs to do where I can plot some of his deliverables, uh, what his desire is. But um, that we've done most of it and we'll be able to talk through that situation. So I'm just going to do some intros in terms of what this career assessment is all about. And then we'll every now and again switch back to JG and ask him why his graphs look so funny uh, and how can I how may <laughs> explain that. OK, so this is guys, this is what this thing's all about. What we what we feel and certainly what I found is that we leave this career of ours and we don't pay enough attention to where we're going. And I really like this map that we've applied to data management. It's something that Andy Stanley brought up and, he, and I sort of like this one is, is sometimes we get lost and we don't know that we lost. So we're going down a hole in our career and we, we're not always going in the right direction. So um, I must say that, please, it's, it's not as if we're saying that your, your past work experience has been a waste of time. You know, that, that's not what we're saying. But sometimes we have to learn how to walk in the right path and not, and not get distracted. So fortunately, I've been walking with JG for some time, um, and it's been great to see lately how JG is very particular about the work that he takes on and his involvement in different engagements. We were talking a little bit about that sustainability product. JJ, any comments from you on, on following this path and making sure you're going in the right direction? Yeah, Howard, uh, the um, principle of the path I do find interesting because it immediately recommends, it, it immediately advise, suggests that there are two paths or two walks that are happening concurrently what you're busy with and and uh, you know uh, which clients are paying you and what you're busy with and your immediate kind of um, responsibilities. But what I quite like about uh, the challenge that this principle of the path offers is whilst you are doing that, whilst you're doing your current job, because data has got so many different facets to it, um, you know, which ones of those are you focusing on that you actually, of course, you're going to deliver for your business and you're going to get the, the, you know, you're going to get the ball in the back of the net um, with respect to whichever analytics or data initiative you're driving. But as you're doing that, you, you're going, you know, do I focus on the process? Do I focus on the value? Do I focus on the governance? Do I focus on the um, the privacy the, every single time we touch things we can get better at any one of those and I, I just get a sense that um, if we never lose sight of the fact that whilst we're doing our job there are other things that we can be looking to excel at and trade others to parity then this principle of the path the principle of the path for me is really is really powerful fantastic and, and I think I think what what we've found is is sometimes when when we look at our career path, um, we find out that we have been going down the wrong direction. It's I think we always use that analogy. It's not like we can't take the car into the workshop and say, oh, please just fix this, uh, redo the engine or whatever it is. We have to actually get back to where we left and, and start walking in the right direction. So it's, you know, and, and we have to get into this habit of, of of going down the right direction. So let me keep going and, and just show some of the, the information. Now, this is, I read, I did some reading this morning and 
uh, and I'd just like to share a story, a personal story for myself is, is and uh, this is applies to me, is 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones you did do. And uh, that's certainly a challenge I faced in my career, where in some cases now I'm having to do executive awareness, uh, executive awareness workshops. And I realized that my communication and the way in which I've learned to communicate with executives, especially at the board level, is not up to scratch. And I, I realize and I can see some of the people that have been to the big management consultants like uh, KPMG, McKinsey, PwC, and you, re and you notice how slick they are and you notice how much they've learned in being able to talk to management. And there was quite a nice article by, by Don uh, Steenkamp this morning, Dr. Don Steenkamp, who was uh, sharing about a book that was blaming management consultants for leading companies down the wrong direction, especially government companies. But I don't believe that it's a problem with the, with, with the consultants. Um, I think there's more to it. He, he points out there's more to it, but this is an area that, that has challenged me. Um, and I look back and I, I almost you know cringe that I didn't go in the right direction. I just went IBM and I wanted to go and work in a laboratory in the US and, I, and if I didn't see anybody, that was fine. I, I was actually quite comfortable with that. Um, we're, and now I, I regret not being able to communicate as effectively as I should with people that make the main decisions. Okay, that's, that to me is, is a regret and, and, it's, and it's a regret. This is 20 years later and I'm regretting where I am, but it's not that you can't overcome it. It's just that you, that's the challenge that you face. Um, and one of the things that, that I found as well is, is this thing of never stop growing. And we, I, I've spoken to so many people where they just keep on doing the same thing, the same thing, they get very frustrated. They try to go to another job and they do, but then they get into the same rut and, and the cycle repeats. And it's about us having to really find our way through, uh, make sure that we're not, we, we're not growing. And if we have stopped growing, then we have to make some decisions. Be very open and honest with your, with your management and that to say, okay, how do we, how do we develop? How do we improve? Uh, and then if we can't get it done within that area, well, then maybe it's time to, maybe it's time to move on. Um, and I just like these quotes from Mark Twain. He said, I have accomplished and talented you are. There are always new skills to acquire. And we live that. I mean, with all the new AI and chat GPT, this is something we're living all the time. And every season of your life offers avenues for further flourishing. So, so some important things for us. And, and please, what I'm saying here, it's, it's not just about your work career. There's all sorts of other benefits. Uh, for example, coaching and mentoring and things like that. But I think this rat trap is the one that we get caught in, right? We seized by the daily routines. And when we look back, um, we've had some challenges. Now, I remember JG once or twice, I think maybe even three times, JG, you've almost had pauses in your career where you spent time, maybe a month or so, just assessing where you're going and what's important to you. Am I? I think I remember that after UTI or no, no, I think there was a UTI one, but it was also a cargo, right? Cargo, yeah. Anything you'd yeah. like to, if anything you can share on that? Yeah, sure. How that goes back a bit, but if I think about how it was the catalyst for where I am right now, it was really one of those um, decision points that redirected um, some of the things that I did, you know. And, I was working for a logistics company. Um, they hadn't done anything with their data. And so I was really kind of almost encouraging and pioneering the data space of logistics, excuse me, uh, uh, analytics and logistics. And what's really hard there is sometimes you jump between companies and it's difficult to join the data. So I, I, I had this long run of analytics in logistics and I got to a point where I needed to find out whether I was ever ever going to go back to healthcare. So I have a medical background. 
and I, I'd, I'd gone long and dark, long and deep on logistics, and the logistics company was loving the fact that they could now see things across um, multiple stakeholders of their supply chain. It was early days supply chain visibility, and I was, oh goodness, I've got this unfinished business in healthcare. Why, you know, why did I, why did I study healthcare? Is there some? Should I not be applying data to healthcare? And it was one of those moments where you're going, but it's going so well here. It's it's amazing. It's like we, you know, we are unleashing uh, analytics on top of uh, logistics um, supply chains, which nobody had ever been. Well, when I say nobody, they the companies had never been able to see and make these kind of decisions. And there was some um, some really nice, you know, the 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 value was amazing, but. For me personally, I went, well, am I actually a logistician or am I actually a healthcare matter? And I needed to actually stop at that point, look back at the path that I'd come versus the ambition that I had desire for. And that was my pivot where I actually took my data skills and I, I took literally how it, as you said, it was two months, um, proposed to my wife that uh, I wasn't going to have a job for a while. That was interesting, <laughs> um, you know, and she said, you know, what is this data thing? Uh, it was really new. I mean, we we are probably talking 15, 20 years ago now. And um, 15 years ago now, and, and it was like, no, no, no. Imagine, imagine we can apply this, um, the, the, the logistics thinking for data analytics within um, some healthcare uh, use cases and scenarios. And so how it was that, actually, I had to stop, figure out, yeah. you know, uh, where, where's my core driver? I was really like, it was really hard because the people were loving the analytics in the logistics space, but I personally needed to find out for myself, am I a logistician or am I actually a Healthcare matter wanting to apply logistics principles that I've learned and so on. So it was a very a, a valuable time. And it was fact, it was so valuable. I've used that technique two more times. I have a very mm. patient wife. I have a very patient wife. <laughs> and then I remember JG went to work for UTI Pharma. Um, and we built a whole lot of BI reports. And, and I really remember the one day we made a decision that um he was going to make this BI work in the business. So he left the IT BI department and then he created a, or went into a business department to run a business with the reports. Uh, what was that one about, JG? Oh, Howard, it was one of those. Imagine the following scenarios. I was getting to the stage where I was running the analytics, um, uh, as run analytics division. We had we had incredible insight in terms of how every single drug was moving through the country. So imagine you you operating in a uh, urban spoke model where almost um, the, out of all the pharmaceutical companies that you can imagine, well, th there are around about thirty or forty pharmaceutical companies who make up the market share in South Africa. Imagine um, eighty percent of them their product all coming into one warehouse all barcoded, and then you get to watch where the product goes. I mean, can you imagine sitting on top of that data and what you can do with it, right? So there I was driving use case upon use case, and I was getting quite frustrated with my business colleagues or my peers because they thought that they could use the data as an optional extra. I was like, no, 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 no. Like, how, how, does, how, did, how, did, how did analytics become an optional extra? And... Mm. and and it was, I'll never forget the one guy who's in charge of sales and, uh, dude, 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 how can, you be <laughs> guess, how can you be guessing? And so I'll, I'll never forget, um, it was literally, I had that conversation with him. I, uh, I then asked for a meeting with the CEO. I walked into the CEO's office and I said, look, I want to propose the following is I'm running the analytics data team. I actually want to run a business unit, but here's my commitment. I'm going to run that business unit based on the data. I'm going to drive the analytics team to continue to furnish the business with the data that I think is needed to run a business division. And then one of two things are going to happen. I'm either going to be really successful and you need to know that, or I'm going to be not successful and I need to know that. 
And to his credit, this guy, the Darwin's Jerji, that's the most bizarre proposal I've ever heard. Yeah. Um, you know, I did know that one of the divisions, the person was moving on. I was aware of that. I was well suited to that. So it wasn't irresponsible from the business's perspective. Maybe it was irresponsible putting me in there, but I then took over this division and I, I, I used the data. I was able to um, grow that division faster than any of the others and it spawned another division. So it was diagnostics and diagnostics. I was able to illustrate it's got a twin. It's got a twin called therapeutics, diagnostics and therapeutics. I used the data to pivot and then we started a, another division. And I, I, excitingly, I found out maybe two months ago that that division, that, 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 that medical devices division is now as big as the pharma division. Wow. I mean, oh. so Howard, you know, those are the those are those pivot moments and you, you know, you've got yeah. to be brave and people, people around you need to be brave, um, including your wife. <laughs> JG, but that's, as you were talking, I'm thinking, what an amazing journey for a CDO that actually says, okay, I'm going to now bet my career on running the business on the data compared to just giving them the data and saying, use it. Oh, it was more a case of like, am I being stupid, I, I needed to get to the bottom of, so it almost was like, instead of betting my career, it was almost like, have I, have I been, have I been building my career on the wrong stuff? Right. I, I almost needed to test the, the hypothesis that if one is um, running your business with respect to the data you can see, like, do you do better than the people that are guessing? And, you know, there were seven divisions. And I knew exactly the date I took over. I messed flip things up in the first two months. Um, <laughs> and and then I got into my stride. It was completely different. Can you imagine you're running an analytics team and now you're running a yeah. sales, you know, you're running your sales, marketing, ops, um, and debt collection. You're, you're running full order to cash cycle. So I messed it up for two months. I saw what I was doing wrong. I then, you know, and from that moment on, so I mean, I'd love to say, oh, from the first moment on, everything was fine. It wasn't. Yeah. I, messed it, I messed it up for, for at least 10 weeks. But then I could start to see I, what I mean, how awesome I could see changes in my decisioning and then all of a sudden I could see this wow. thing start to come up then it was like you know what this is working then I had the confidence to be really like go aggressively canvas for some more clients and and then at oh. the same time whilst that thing's growing the diagnostics then pivot to the devices and so I need like I needed to know that I wasn't talking complete nonsense and so now I feel like I've in my career now, when I, I walk into a room, I, I walk in with scars. But you, yeah. you know, that's how you, and, and I've seen the same with you. I really feel like you, like, you know, how I was watching you. Um, I've never seen that many board members in, in a room that there was a, you know, that bank in Saudi that um, you were. A and you B, were, yeah. I mean, there were. 13, 14, 13, yeah. 14 board yeah. members for an ad hoc presentation. I mean, where does that happen, right? And so I'm going, cool, yeah, you might feel like you've got some work to do, but shucks, in my opinion, I thought that you were able to galvanize the room and, and make it quite applicable. So I, I, and subsequently, I look for scars. So when I'm hiring now, I hire for scars. Okay. Anybody? anybody Fantastic. Scars, yeah. Would would you would you recommend this journey to other CDOs? Do you feel that it was a a good test of of your confidence in the data? Because it is about learning and teaching the executives how to make decisions based on data, how to be date driven by data. Um, I mean, it was terrifying, Howard. So, like, I'm not sure I would openly convince anybody to go on as terrifying a journey. But let's remember, this was 10 years, this is between eight and 10 years ago, data wasn't vogue, data wasn't yeah. up its hype cycle. It was really early on to say, you know, supply chain visibility was 
like how do you do that how do you join these things i mean we were um the, i mean it would really it would really bait um the, the hammer remember when hammer was being built yeah 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 what what i needed to do was was build a data uh you needed to build a perspective of the um total landed cost of a hammer vehicle built in south africa now you must know that that thing's getting parts from every single part of the world and they're coming by ship, they're coming by air, they're coming by rail, they're sometimes merging, they've got demurrage, they've got different tariffs and rates. Let me just did like that. That was the that was that was those were the problems that didn't have solutions when we were in this mode. I think now um you don't have to convince anybody in fact i think the c-suite are desperately saying how do i um make sure that i'm i'm getting the necessary um platform or layering to my data solutions in place i don't think there's any guessing anymore so i actually think that nobody really needs to go on that terrifying journey anymore i think what uh, that, that for yeah that's that's gone oh um so I'm hoping that nobody else has to do it like I did it. I mean, I think we 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 stand on each other's shoulders, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. how I remember I remember when I had been running that business and I then needed to come back and familiarize myself to how data had moved. You know, literally, all of a sudden, what used to be you know state of the art dimensional modeling was now routine, and you know things had moved on to data lakes and and other things. So that's you know when you when you brought me back into the fold, that's how those things came together. So I would say that um, there's no need. I'd, I wouldn't advocate that level of absolute. Okay. Absolute Radical. no. Yeah, I, I don't think that's for everybody. <laughs> but if anybody okay. wants to talk about what it feels like. <laughs> yeah, right. happy to chat, yeah. Certainly anybody, if, if anyone's got any questions for JG, please put up your hand and, and we'll we'll go. Uh, we'll stop and that. Um, so the next one is is you know these are borrowed from somebody else and and I like this one in terms of saying uh, we tend to become the voices we listen to the most mm. and eventually mimic the viewpoints we readily accommodate. So what's important message here is is if you I do believe mentorship is critical. I do believe having the right mentor. Is critical, but you you have to be careful with choosing your source of mentorship. Um, and I know that Manja's on here as well. She does quite a bit of coaching. So so finding that right mentoring and going down the right direction is is important. But also for those of us who who are looking to become mentors, um, I think there's also something we need to be to recognise is that you know the good mentors are are sincerely interested in assisting up and coming talent and and we find so many of our people are wanting this mentorship wanting this career guidance and and as jg was talking about standing on the shoulders of others we are and then when we get to a certain age where we can turn around and help people to the top of the mountain um so what is it what is mentorship for every one of us and and i promise you doesn't matter what age you are in, there's someone ahead of you that can guide you through your current situation. So, so please don't think that uh, by the time you get to 60, 65, that you you no longer need a mentor. I think these help all the time. Okay, so that's just some background. What I wanted to share with you is this is an image that um, we put together for JG. It's been a really fascinating journey. And we're wanting to build this for our superheroes, but we're also wanting to build it for uh, teams within each company, right? So when you set up a data management office, um, it's helpful for you to understand the people in your team, where their strengths are, where uh, where they need support. Um, and what we did here was we used something called Mid Journey that that uses Open AI, and you can interact with it and give we gave it these words jg so with mid journey we'd say please build us a view of a chief data officer which is strategic has these strengths the ideation 
the positivity, futuristic, and woo, and those are JG's top five Clifton strengths. And we could feed these words into the mid journey engine, and it created this this image for us. Um, That's amazing. And we so we also it's added incredible. some. Con <laughs> so really, I mean, it was lovely working with my son Andrew, who's uh, he's very artistic, but having this type of facility and this open AI where we could ask it to create these images for us was was fantastic. Um, so this is this is the way in which the 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 superhero car would look and we would have a role. This SFIA is is the skills for the Internet age and we've rated JG as level four and his data management experience. We've rated, rated him as a four out of five, which is a translator. And we'll give you some more details on that. But this is really helpful for people to able to show where their natural strengths are. We we try not to use the word weakness. We basically say these are areas that you you need to pay attention to and deal with it at the right time. So if we look at some details here, um, let's just talk about the role. The, the key, the two key points that we talk about in terms of the CDO role is making sure that data is strategic and remains business focused. OK, so we're not doing AI for AI's sake, but everything's driven by delivering business value. And then ensuring that we are effectively managing. So are we so are we looking after the data management effectiveness and then are we looking after the data? So we're growing two assets. The asset by data and then the asset for the data management. That's that's what we see the role is. Um, I seem to be in a loop. <laughs> Not sure what. OK, so this is uh, SFIA. Any of those of you who are setting up a data management organization, this is a fantastic uh, level hierarchy that you can use to rate your people especially if you're in HR and things like that. Um, the UK have done a fantastic job. We, we, we are applying it in Saudi, and these are the different levels that we have. OK, then we go to uh, what we refer to as our personal data management maturity assessment. And this is where JG came out, and we almost start off that you unaware of a capability, you then become aware, but success depends on team members, the support of team members. So we need team members to help us. And please remember, you may be, maybe for example, you've been doing data architecture and then you decide I want to go and do data governance. And, and you may have to drop down a few levels before you can build back up again. So Jay, this is where we see JG at the moment is a lot of his knowledge, skills and competencies and ability around the area of chief data officer are quantified and, and controlled. OK, then we did. Yeah, um, you know, Howard, Howard a, if you just go, if you just wouldn't mind going back one, you know, the question that you asked earlier, like, would you would you be as would you suggest somebody else's as radical? And, and I, I still stand by it. I uh, say no, but I'm just looking at and thinking that if I knew that there were these levels and grades, I, I would have been able to do a much better job preparing myself rather than thinking yeah. that I just had to toggle and switch and try. Um, so these uh, layer, these layers, when when once when when one is aware of them and knowing how to get from one to the other, it's really empowering. And so yeah. I, I stand by the fact that I wouldn't suggest people toggle like I did. I, I mean, I'm living testimony that I didn't die through the process, but shucks, there has to be a better way. Yeah. And this this for right. me is it, right? So thanks, Hart. Fantastic. OK, great. Um, so then we also looked at uh, JG's Clifton strengths. Um, and this is quite a nice uh, way of, of doing an assessment of, of where your strengths are. And we break them up into four major themes, executing, influencing, relationship building and strategic thinking. And we've noticed now that as we've been doing these strengths across many and many, as many of our, our data people as possible, we're starting to pick up 
uh, certain patterns. Okay, so one of the patterns we've been picking up, and, and it's interesting to see with JG, is that that role of a CDO, A, is strategic thinking, and B, is this relationship building. So if he's going to get all of the executives on the C-level suite thinking and changing and moving forward, it's it's through that relationship, okay? Through that connectedness, we 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 sport, we talk about a guiding coalition. Um, JG, remember when we were advising uh, Ahmed for, uh, at, uh, in terms of his role as becoming a CDO? We we actually yeah. spoke. One of the important things you have to do right in the beginning is is get connected with a a small group of the people and make sure that they're all buying into it and then and then moving forward. Okay, then, so this is JG's Clifton Strengths. Predominantly strategic, strategic thinking with some influencing and relationship building, they were almost the same. And then his executing is um, not his strong point. Not to, <laughs> not to say that Come he on, can't sir, execute. You can say it. his <laughs> executing is poor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, it was interesting to see when we uh, and Paul Bolton was here. As I did this whilst we we came and we were doing a Saudi project, and I had these two, Paul and JG, which were almost similar, and and the executing was low. Mine, on the other hand, was was high up on the executing, and I said, "Oh my goodness, I'm, this is going to be a, a quite a challenge to get these guys to deliver this project on time." <laughs> I remember having those discussions in Saudi. Um, but yeah, this is this is something now. What we so this is a, a really Is nice layout. Was yes. that why we were put in the same room together? And how it sat in a different room? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, It was just we were in the box. I seeing didn't if leave we could boxing deliver. in that room with us, but yeah, at least we had Rollos, right? Yeah. Rollos that were melting the TV. And we delivered, and we had to ask him where his deliveries were. So how would we use Rolos to achieve deliverable dates? No, I know. I, Whoever got their first good Rolo. <laughs> so, uh, anyway. so this is when we do the assessment, we get a total of 32. And then this is what it looks like. OK, and so here we're seeing that uh, JG is pr very strong at the strategic thinking. OK, very strong. Um, and then we got relationship building and influencing. Um, and we use the the position to score the the rating, okay, and and we found some interesting things there in terms of JG's ability to convince people, uh, to get them to buy into a new direction, and uh, you know I remember doing that those use case ideation sessions, and I could see JG how amazing he was at getting the people to share their challenges and and what they want to do and where they want to go, and there was quite a level of excitement. And I, and I think that's critical for a CDO uh, to get people to buy into that direction um, and then to move forward. OK, then we went to JG's thinking styles uh, and, and I may get Veronica to explain these thinking styles because she does such a great job of it. But this is what we're noticing. This is what we're picking up. Can you see where that CDO, the, the sort of shape on the graph being closer to the concrete random? type of scenario. OK, and this is so this is the results JG had. Can you see the concrete random? Um, but what's important is to notice is that he's he's low on these areas and you're not going to be. I mean, there are some people that are very balanced. They're basically 40 on all these areas. That's been impressive. But JG needs people around him that will do the concrete sequential and abstract sequential. OK. So it's people like Veronica that will complement JG. And you can see that uh, we also have Sanjeev and Howard that are also sitting out on the edge of, of concrete randomness. OK, but we need to find people that are going to link and provide that, that full, almost the full quadrant of, of all of these different areas. JG, any comments on, on, on that? I mean, Howard, this was, uh, I showed this to my son um, and he just laughed. He went, you I mean, of course, you, you're absolutely useless. <laughs> <These things. laughs> 
um, and and so I guess uh, you know how I I've been I've been lucky enough to work in some really kind of varied teams um, with you know particularly uh, global reach teams and I just have learned that it's the it's if you can manage the complexity that comes with difference the teams that have complementary skills are always stronger because you're just yeah. that much more robust that much more able to handle the unknowns and adapt to some of the the challenges that come and so the point that you've raised is so key is so you have a particular profile awesome before you analyze your profile too much have a look at what you need to supplement and yeah. you know, and i can see this already and and um howard we were talking earlier on the call is you know i'm i'm now in a phase of of data um data analytics startup um, i'm trying to i'm trying to um uh, uh, operationalize a data product in a startup mode and there Oh, it's been so apparent that there are pieces missing, and that you you got to choose your choose your partners well, and look for the overlaps. And then, but then most important, you don't box with each other because you're different. You got to celebrate the fact that you're different. Yeah, um, that's important thing. And, and, and I think and, that's yeah. what we're trying to do with these cards. So, uh, one of the things we do with the cards, if if you have the cards in the team, is that each person, when when you look to build that team it's about finding people with those other strengths that that, that are going to complement you so when you see the jg card there then it's okay this is where we're strong this is for example on the eight and the ones down below well we need someone who's going to be lifting us up on on those scores so that's the idea on on we're building a strategy game so people can be strategic about the the their team that they built. And maybe just to pause there, I know we're getting towards the top of the hour. Are there any questions, anything that anyone would like to, th those are our fundamental data tools in terms of your strengths, and then we apply them to your role. So we'll now go and show you how it's applied to the role, but maybe just to give people an opportunity to ask. I know, Johan, you're looking at this, uh, you're looking at your team at Convergence, how how do you guys see it? Is is this something that would benefit you? Yeah, Howard, we're actually using the Cliftons um, to also mix our teams. Um, oh, okay. We found on our clients that it's very useful way possible to actually have complementary um, strengths uh, team members. Um, it really makes for a well-rounded team. So yeah, absolutely agree. Nice. Thank you very much. Thanks, Johan. Any 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 other questions? Manj, maybe you I know you deal with this sort of thing quite a lot. What what's your view on it? Hey, thanks, Howard. This is this is fascinating. Uh, I'm I'm reflecting on on what we use in terms of the ENIA assessment and Right. And that right. takes, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that takes yes, I am. quite, yeah. yeah, takes quite a in-depth view in terms of not just where one applies, but how one's view is with regard to strengths and weaknesses. So everything then becomes a learning opportunity and everything then yeah. becomes a kind of way forward in terms of, okay, so this is the gap that needs to be filled and and so in a lot of ways they they kind of yeah they kind of fill in the unknowns for you but also you start to become a little bit more reflective in terms of what is what is the right. discovery point and the decision point for me am i aligning to my purpose because more more or less you always come back to what is my purpose at the end of the day? What do I actually want to achieve in terms of big picture? And then apply it to what's what's on your desk to do for that day. Right. And so right. The, I think the exercise would be then at the end of the day to recap and see, did I align with that purpose that I set out to do when I got up at the, uh, you know, um, got up 
out of bed. Yeah. Because I heard this, uh, I hear this thing about passion and purpose quite often, but somehow to me, it always comes back to a kind of right. The North Star is your guiding purpose. And that I think is where most of the work goes into. And yeah. so if these tools and these instruments can help flesh out that purpose, then I think the rest is a matter of slotting the the pieces in. Then you can appreciate the diversity that somebody else right. offers you because you, yeah. you realize that it is um, feeding into the gap inside you. So always we're trying to complete those incompletes in ourselves. Right. And right. to the extent that these instruments and tools can help us do that is the extent that they're successful. Right. Yeah? And 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 that's uh, it's a great point you bring in because what we've started to do man, the next level is to say this type of deliverable requires someone with good concrete sequential. So, for example, when we're building policies and procedures, we want someone who will be linearly at delivering those things, principles, policies and procedures. And so we we start basically saying that two things. One is, yes, we could find the best person. If you can't find the best person, then uh, those of us are random. We We almost have to lock ourselves away or find the right time of the day to do that concrete sequential work. So it's, it's also finding then how do I prioritize and how do I how do I ensure that I can deliver on things that maybe I'm not, uh, you know, where we need. Uh, so if we can bring down to all the DMBOK deliverables, if you can say this is the type of attitude that you should take towards this deliverable. That's why we call it KSCA, knowledge, skills, competencies and attitude. If we apply that attitude, this is going to get us the best result. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, any anybody else? Any other questions? So, Howard, could you just go back a slide? Yeah. That that that, um, that landing or that positioning of the different C suites, I um, folk. I mean, that slide. When you when you look at that, is is that um, is that making sense to you with respect to a CFO and a CTO? I see that, you know, they often boxing. I get that. The, the fact that the CDO is off that, what looks like off the line, like, um, why do you think that is? And, and uh, is that a, is, is this a um, good um, way to so I'm, help? So what, I'd, I must, what I must admit is that when it comes to the CFO, uh, and that I don't have a lot of data um, because, you know, well, I, I sort of use Miles and Claire as, as, as that sort of scenario. But one of the things I'm, I'm wanting to focus on is I just, um, for example, a management on for running an EIM program, there's lots of setting the roadmap, setting the actions and driving that thing through. Um, mm. The CDO can be pretty random in in jumping around and, and coordinating within the business, but we then need a data governance manager or an EIM manager that's going to keep the line uh, according to the strategy built by the CDO. And that's the one that's going to be in reality, and Veronica may be able to explain, uh, that 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 C is the concrete sequential person is very much a reality person. I think I'm going to get to Veronica's notes. Um, this is a concrete sequential based in reality. Information detected through the five sense process information in an ordered sequential linear way. Um, and then remember the facts and break projects into step and then quiet working environments. Veronica, I don't know if you would like to share anything more on that. No, only that's me. Um, yeah. Not necessarily the quiet work environment, but I need things to be orderly. Um, and and yeah. I'm a box ticker. I'm very happy when I've got boxes to tick. Whereas Howard okay. hates that. <laughs> the other thing yeah. with the, the sequentials and the randoms, it's the way you take, uh, the way you order your your um, information. Concrete and abstract is the way you take it in. And um, 
the, the way you order it to sequential random. And one of the analogies was if you if you given a subject to study, the sequentials will start at the beginning of the textbook and work through it in order in orderly fashion. The randoms will jump around, but at the end of the time, both will have, have have a knowledge of the material that needed to be studied. It's just that they go about it in a different way. The randoms yeah. like to have lots of balls in the air, whereas for the sequentials, that is that freaks us out. Yeah. So, you know, that for for me, to having to be working on too many things at once, it makes me extremely anxious because I know I'm going to drop something. Whereas for a, a random, that's exhilarating, and you have to do it. So you've got to find a way of doing these. Things you don't, you're not naturally strong at. And and this is sort of what I wanted to bring back for JG is is, and I know JG when I first met him he was playing the role of project management, and he can JG can certainly do the project management, but don't don't get him there for too long. <laughs> JG, maybe you can share some of those stories. I, I may be misinterpreting your your skills. No, no, Howard, not at all. I, I mean. So I guess it comes down to the amount of energy that it takes to execute. You know, when you are in, when you're in, so for example, for project management, I, it, it was so hard for me and required so much energy. I looked like I was good at it because I didn't let anything move because the moment it moved, I had to move it back. And that was exhausting. So I, uh, it's a really interesting thing to be aware of in a team is the facts. The fact that somebody is good at it doesn't mean that it is in line with what they find exhilarating, um, energizing. And so project yeah. management, and that's why your point was interesting, is don't don't let me do it for long because I, I actually couldn't keep that, couldn't lift that thing forever. It uh, just fall on yeah. the floor. And so project yeah. management for me um People go, oh my word, but that was just so great. Everything was done. I'm like, yeah, but it was done out of a survival rather than out of a, you know, want to make it natural. Yeah. 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 Excellent. So just going forward, that's where JG is. This is the different types of when you get that measurement, organize information through reflection, abstract random. Veronica, I wonder if you can just quickly explain that to people. Uh -huh. The abstract random people are those people that are very concerned about the team. People's people need to be happy and fulfilled and and all of that. Those those are the kind of people that make um, that that are, are good team players and good managers. Um, big picture because they 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 are uh, random. They see they can join all the dots, and they can also. Um, read the room and 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 see things that the concretes can't see the concrete yeah. things black and white whereas the abstract i mean like people can be um th there's this unhappiness in the room but it's, it doesn't show on anyone's face but an abstract will sense it okay so so these are the different areas now sort of what we what we're doing is then Plotting the path. So as JG's sort of got to this professional level, but then it starts to we start to make a question or a decision about what are the next levels of specialist exams or certificates that can or should be taken to get JG to where he wants to be. OK, um, so from now does he go down this route or this route or when he chooses certain activities within the DMBOK deliverables where is the right level of planning development control and operation so these are this is the sort of pathway and I also find it very helpful in having the discussions with people is where 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 would you like to be uh, in say 10 15 years um, would you like to be, for example, a thought leader like Scott Taylor or um, Steve Hoberman or you know Chris Bradley, those type of people, or would you like to be a CDO or a manager or a professional? Or this is what Veronica keeps on saying is no more than a specialist. Um, that's that's where I'm done. 
I've had enough and I don't need to go into these limelight positions. So she's so each person it's helpful to understand well where what pathway do we need to take you on 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 your growth and development and then um, these are the type of things where we talk to JG about saying these are these would be your important areas. Okay, so first certainly there's going to be data governance. You know all these deliverables of creating a strategy. Uh, building an operating model, making sure that the data management department is, is operating. These are the planning areas that JG needs to focus on, and these would be almost his next steps in terms of a roadmap of improving his maturity on these set of deliverables. Okay, now at the same time, you should be looking at data value realization, data ROI, um, and he's also because JG is more of a CDO Gen 2, which is more analytics rather than data management, the, this is the recommendation is to, is to focus on these aspects to take you to uh, where you need to be. So the idea is when you choose your organization, choose your organization that needs a CDO Gen 2, not a CDO Gen 1. That, that's going to establish the foundation. And then when you choose projects, choose the projects in these areas that are going to provide you with the uplift that, that that's important to you. So how does that how does that fit with you, JG? Yeah, Howard, I mean, you just um, it just. It's a bit um, like oh, shucks, I've done a lot of bouncing around. Um, and so, you know, when you've been sharing that, I'm going, yeah, that, that that would have made complete sense to have walked that. I, I almost I almost had to run into the guide rails and bounce backwards and forwards to to find that way through. Um, I do find it challenging at the moment, you know, when I'm um, like data governance has never been something that I would have thought I would have always liked to have had somebody helping on the data governance side so that I can I can have a go on the monetization and data producting and so on. And so you you go, but in a role of a CDO type two, you actually need to have enough. You need to get the job done. You don't necessarily yeah. need to do it, but you need to get it done. And so this is really kind of this is really like empowering to know that um, I operate well within that setting. Well, you guess what? You need someone to help you get that setting in place. Yeah. And so yeah. um I would um I, I uh, yeah, yeah, and then this construct of um I, I think the bottom piece is, you know, BI and big data and data science, there, there's a packaging within a data product that we don't always see coming through the DM box, but I think from an execution perspective, that's what happens is you package the analytics, you package some of the um yeah. the, the, the the tools into a data product. It then becomes a commercial entity on its own, and sometimes the DM box doesn't always show that those linkages through to data product. But I, I would agree okay. completely. So, so JG, this is why I added this data ROI, uh, and I so wanted yeah, to okay. bring in that. Can you see the EDM council? Remember, I've shared these things with mm. you, and mm. what you were mm. just talking about there is also what they call a data co, which is establishing a data company uh, that's linked to the main company. But then it's going to have the rights to the data, the organizational alignments. And so you need to find ways of of where the risk is too high on the original company is to maybe create a data co that, that will do that for you. And, and the great example is the um, a data co set up for for the English Premier League where they've because they were there about governing and they can't get uh, you know, there's certainly conflicts of interest. They created a company that would sell the results to the media, to the betting shops, and they would package the data to to make money out of it. And and these are these are the things that I believe you should. So so I, what I'm I'm glad you mentioned is that the DMBOK isn't in complete. It's not always complete. So we need to be looking at other areas that that create the capabilities um, and, and find the way through. So that's why I added these this other section yeah. over here. 
No, Howard, I mean, it's so interesting when you say that is, you know, you that we, we created an aggregate healthcare product with it in order to offer um, doctors a perspective um, on their aggregate view. Where we yeah. were really struggling was, which is the legal entity that engages with the pharmaceutical right. companies, with the, with the OEMs? Who engages? Because the doctors are going, no, 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 we can't engage. And they're right, they can't, they mustn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. So as you said that, I went, oh, okay, well, that's something I didn't do. Maybe I should have. Sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's interesting, that construct, I can see where it's necessary because I can see what happens if you don't have it. Yeah. Yeah. So so again, these are the, these are the the areas of of that you want to challenge yourself in the next level of your career is how would you set up a data code? How would you handle the data ROI? Um, yeah. But I think you're doing a great job in terms of focusing on the value and all the chats around sustainability. That, that's sort of what you're going through. That's where we are now. Yeah. So, sure. And then. Then the next thing was to actually look to your supporting uh, areas that, and and this is something I'd like to share with everybody is 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 that we must remember that just because you pass three and you get your final CDMP, there is no doesn't mean that that's where you stop. All the time on on spending time learning about data architecture, data modeling, data quality, these are critical to your role. And it's something that you that you need to develop a level of skill in. So it's that sort of priority to growth and learning that you can start to develop and, and, and work on. Now, these days with all these data platforms and data value chains and enterprise data model, the core role that that brings on translating business requirements into technical implementation, this is a role of, of a transformation agent, as they refer to as the data architect. Um, you know, and that's certainly something that that you are capable. And then we talk about all the different models, dimensional modeling and stuff like that, and then the quality. So these are, are probably your next level of um, areas that, that you can pay attention to, because it, it's important then to then embrace the the what and the why, and and to get some practical experience, not just the DM Bach experience. Yes, I'm with you. Okay. Sure, yeah, very. Yeah, it was such a powerful process. Thank you. I, I look forward to seeing what you know how this differs for the next data hero coming along. So thank you so yeah, much. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Sure. Okay. So then, what we do is we 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 do a maturity analysis which is very similar to a data management maturity assessment for an organization, but this is more at a personal level. You know, so so where does JG want to be? Unfortunately, I haven't updated these slides, but it's now understanding uh, what have you acquired? What do you require for the position or the role that you're in and what do you desire? Those are the three questions. And, and and we just need to go through that. I think you may have done it, JG, but I, I wasn't. I didn't. I couldn't find it quickly enough. This was just an example of someone who wanted to become a data architect, and mm. you see there they they wanting to hit the, that level. And we then said, okay, I understand. What does your job require of you? And in this situation, it 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 was a level two, and he wanted a level four. So we said, Shucks, you're going to have to. Be transparent with your business and explain to them that that's your level four is a desire. So these gaps are, are the risky areas, and you now need to look at ways of planning your your journey to to mm -hmm. achieve the acquired. So you wanting to get you wanting to move from acquired to required and then to desired. That's mm -hmm. so you're going to be choosing things to to flesh out. And, and you're going to find your your way through that, and that's where we use this process of a of a personal DMMA. And JJ, I know you've you've done a, a DMMA, but can you see how we apply this now to a professional or a personal? Yeah, how it just starts to become really practical in terms of how you can your aspirational goals that you can set for yourself each you know each period yeah. quarter so on, and also for your team, yeah. right? You can 
just right. help your team articulate where they sure. want to be. And and I guess the powerful thing here is you can say, well, that's great. You might want to be there. The business needs this. How do we meet yes. each other halfway? So yes. really, really powerful. Yeah. And, and and maybe pause around because we use this for what we call a data talent strategy um, where, uh, you know, you, you have your data strategy and then you're saying, well, for me to achieve the data strategy, my people need to be here. So how do I now get and who should I get to be there? So allow the people to start saying, you know, I, I want to be there in that position. Um, okay. So uh, this is where you need to work from your data strategy. You need to build your data talent strategy using this. Um, your data strategy is going to push you to certain levels. It's going to require certain levels. And, and how can we join you from a, your journey from acquired to required to desire? That, that's where we'd like to get everyone along there. But as we say, this, this, requires, this requires a level of in-depth discussion with the people to be able to ascertain exactly where they want to be. And here you can see now that from this, we can determine a risk rating to say, Shaks, our biggest risk is sitting in data governance. Uh, and, and, and then we can understand where we need to focus on so that we can, so that we can build the deliverable path. So you can see here, to get to your required deliverables, then you must be doing this, 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 and this. These are the ones that you should focus on, the level threes. And then we get to twos, and then we get to ones, and stuff like that. So it sort of gives you a, a pathway of the journey that you that you need to go on. Um, I don't know if that sort of makes, makes sense to you, JG, but that you would need to, once you've done the assessment, you'd say, okay, these are my desired areas. This is where I want to be, and then how do we get work for you to do, or how do you choose your projects or your business aligned to what you desire? Yeah, I mean, how do I look at that just with like potential joy? But you know, when you when you're in a startup, I'm like, oh shucks, uh, it's quite yeah, difficult yeah, yeah. to choose. You know, uh, um, so it's really nice to not lose sight of it. Uh, but sometimes you might need to, you know, just knuckle down and and do stuff that you yeah need. yeah no that's that's yeah. that required journey right so so yes. remember we first of all take you from where you are to what your business requires now yeah and, the but also for yes. also for management and hr to know where you want to be so yes this may be for the next period or so but mm. your final goal is when there's an opportunity how do we get you to desire that's that's the different the jumps that we take you through uh, very useful thank you yeah paul is there any comments from your side i mean you've been talking to quite a few hr people academies and things like that any any comments from your side not sure if he's there okay moving on um now what what we've got as well is one of the things that we all battle with is is keeping our keeping our experience up, right? So so how much knowledge have we obtained? How much? How many? What the skill levels? What competency and what attitude we've changed? Now, the worst thing about it is that when you go into these interviews, you can't always remember what you've done, what you've presented, what areas you've spoken on, and it's and it's a lot easier that you. You keep track of all this work as you're doing it. So what are the presentations that you've been on? Have you been to an international presentation? Where did you present? What knowledge area? What was the rating? Okay, what was the duration? And then these are all the webinars. So this is where I keep all my webinars together. Who does what? Uh, understand what work I've done. And then look at my skills. What certifications have I achieved? Um, and then, of course, I've got things like electrical engineering and computer science, which um, is not really applicable. I mean, it's foundational, but it's it's not applicable immediately. So, you know, I have got a certain level of qualification. Um, and then we do a competency. OK, so what's our project, our working experience? So what working experience have we had and what institutions do you belong to and what roles are you playing? 
along the, at the different institutions. OK, and then the last one is, a, is an attitude one, which is more of a change management. But um, it's so helpful if you yeah, a, if you can use this data and I'm missing some visualizations because that really is your CV at the end of the day. People want to know around the DMBOC where, where your experiences are in all of these different years and, and things like that and where we you'd like to be. So any any comments from your side, JG? Sure. Uh, yeah, hard. I mean, I just if uh, it would be. When you when you realize that the data disciplines consist of such a broad spectrum of um, capabilities, and I've I've touched on some I've I, I didn't even know some others existed. So I mean I've got lots of work to do to really just kind of go okay I've done a bit of this and a bit of that. Um, you know I've never prepared a data catalog. I don't know how important they are. I've never done it myself, but I, I've depended on it. So I guess some of the questions that come to mind are like when we say proficiency is like, you know, of usage or of actually knowing how to do that. Um, so uh, this has given me lots of food for thought. Yeah, thanks, Hard. I, this piece in particular, I'm like, oh, shucks, I feel mine would just be quite, quite random. <laughs> <laughs> well, it suits you, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, but yeah, real uh, um, sure how just incredible to see these things coming together. And then we, you know, when you say CV, it's like, yeah, I mean the data, the data, um, employing data professionals in the future. Imagine that we are able to quickly ascertain this type of um, competence versus I'm a, uh, you know, I do. You know data models or i do you know um anybody yeah. comes to me with like a an ai model i just want to know whether it's in production or not <laughs> it's, it's like, <laughs> like you know, we can do lots of things but is it in production you know so i think yeah, that yeah. this is this really helps us get through the hype cycle and into the delivery cycle because we'll know what people have we'll know um we'll know how to uh, orchestrate teams or combine teams. I thought what Johan said was really powerful there in terms of um, just like trying to blend teams such that the client experience is one that is good for business. And so, yeah. you know, these things, the value proposition of these things go all the way through to team composition, to, um, you know, delivery breakdown and also to, to recruiting. Fantastic. But yeah, how, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, really. Thank you, JG. Thanks very much. And, and no, it was a privilege. So that, it was a privilege to be a guinea pig. I, I love that. And uh, <laughs> you know, congratulations so, to the the thinking behind that kind of da that data fantasy league. I mean, how awesome that you know that again. I just always say that from a community perspective, we've got cool stuff in South Africa. And um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Fantastic. All right. So Thanks, any. So we. That brings it to the end of the of the presentation. Are there any questions? Is, would anyone like to ask a question, observation? Are there things that you would like to see that we've missed out? Maybe um, do you see that the strategy game of of planning your teams and your career is is of use to you? Yes, Johan. I know, um, Howard, I can definitely see the value in this. Like I said in the commentary is we have um, quite a young crowd in our company um, and for them to actually start out this journey the right way, um, I think will be, I don't know if you can measure the value of that. Um, if you have a 25, 27 year old engineering graduate that wants to do data but doesn't, doesn't know yet exactly right. where. I mean, it's amazing. And and maybe we can ask Veronica to to jump in here because Veronica taught Sunlum Academy. She taught something like 20 graduates. And then we had a career assessment. Veronica, just your experience of, of sharing with the just newly graduated people, just started working. Um, yes, they they were they were very excited and they were they hadn't grasped the um, the fact that they needed to look so far into the future. 
mm. as well. And and we we opened their eyes a bit to what was possible. And it was really, really lovely to see how, you know, their faces lit up and they say, well, could I do this? And mm-hmm. um, yeah, they were selected. They were fairly homogenous in the selection. They were selected for strategic thinking skills, but they actually were very different. All of them were very different and they had different aspirations and different strengths and and um, different interests. Yeah, and that yeah, was interesting, okay. JG. Just to share what with Veronica was saying is, we we mapped out their thing, their Clifton strengths, and they were so high on on strategic thinking, and we shared it with the HR department, and they said that's exactly why we chose them. They they weren't that they, they'd never done this thing, and they said, oh, that's amazing because this is what we looked for. These people, we look we looked for strategic thinkers. Um, now, of course, they got to then battle through their career where they can't always go into a strategic thinking position. But mm-hmm. it was now, how do we get there? But that was quite phenomenal when we when this thing came out and there were so many strategic thinkers in one uh, one group of graduates. Okay. Any any and thanks, Johan. Thank you for those comments. Any any other comments or questions? People are, are. Would anyone like to participate or be involved? I feel like I'm trying to push a stone up you. <laughs> it's not at all hard. I mean, yeah. it's a, such a such a privilege to be able to see yourself like this. I mean, you got to you got to. There are lots of scars. On this yeah. on Rootsy here, but I, I'm I'm okay with scars. It's like whatever. It's my chosen career. I'm loving it, loving the people I'm working with. So, um, I could I would encourage anybody to. It's such a privilege to be able to just get a view like this. So yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so so uh, if there's no comments from anybody, love to hear from you. Love to see your response on the recording. But thanks everybody for attending, and um. We'll see you next week. Awesome. Thanks, Howard. Thank you so much. Thanks, team. Bye. Thanks, JG. Thanks for helping us. No, love you. Thanks, everybody. Cheers, team.